Okay, great. Good evening. Uh, welcome to today's policy talk featuring former Secretary of the Navy, Don Winter. Special welcome to all of you who are serving or have served in our armed forces. Thank you for your service. I'm Alec Gallimore, Robert J. Vlasic, Dean of Engineering, and I'm pleased to join our colleagues from the Ford School of Public Policy and the Ross School of Business as co-sponsors of what promises to be an engaging evening. After his introduction, Secretary Winter will present his remarks. Then he and Ross School's Dr. Mark Barger will have a dialogue about the topics raised. We will have some time toward the end for questions from the audience. Please hand your questions to the two Ford School students who are collecting them, and please be sure to silence your phones. Don Winter served as the 74th Secretary of the Navy from January 2006 to March 2009. As Secretary of the Navy, he led America's Navy and Marine Corps team. He was responsible for an annual budget in excess of $125 billion and nearly 900,000 people. Previously, Dr. Winter held multiple positions in the aerospace and defense industry as a systems engineer, program manager, and corporate executive. From 2010 to 2012, Dr. Winter served as chair of the National Academy of Engineering Committee charged with investigating the causes of the deep water horizon blowout for the Secretary of the Interior. Today, he is an independent consultant and a professor of engineering practice at Michigan Engineering. He teaches graduate level courses on systems engineering, space systems, and maritime policy. He consults in the US and overseas on defense and civil matters, and serves on multiple corporate, civic, and academic boards. He's chairman of the Australian Naval Shipbuilding Advisory Board and is DOD senior defense industry advisor to Ukraine. Dr. Winter is a recipient of the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Dr. Winter earned his doctorate in physics from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Dr. Don Winter. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be back. Good to be back here. Let me see if I can get this working right here. Uh, whoops. Okay. What I'm going to try to do today is just provide you with a brief synopsis of a few thoughts that uh, I've developed over the years of dealing with various organizations and trying to understand how those organizations are able to perform and in particular the resiliency of those organizations as they face uh, different challenges. Uh, and one of the things I've found in the process is that there are certain concepts here, uh, concepts associated with the uh, recognition of responsibility, the assignment of authorities, and the whole concept of accountability that really has a significant impact on how organizations are able to perform and how they're able to work through such matters. Uh, one aspect that you can see here is that uh, these concepts are not all that well understood, I will have to say. Uh, the whole idea of what is authority, what is responsibility, what is accountability. They're not commonly understood, and as a result, we wind up in many cases of having a different perspective uh, on, on such matters. I want to see if I can get the computer here to work properly for me. Oh, what's... Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, what I was trying to get to here is that people don't have common understandings of what these concepts mean. I have three postulates that I like to put forward that I think help explain what all of this means. Uh, first of all, authority, the power to execute. Authorities need to be delegated. I've seen senior executives try to do everything themselves, invariably a failure. 
one has to be able to delegate authority to be able to have an efficient operation. When you're doing that, however, you don't delegate responsibility. You share responsibility with those people that you are delegating authority to. And oh, by the way, along with that responsibility comes the concept of accountability. And accountability has to be measured, has to be appropriately structured in such a way as to further the objectives of the organization. And it should not be politicized, although it often is. Uh, one of the best examples I've found of politicalization uh, has to do with the L'Aquila, Italy earthquake that occurred roughly 10 years ago. Uh, this earthquake, basically a Richter 6 earthquake that occurred at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, killed over 300 residents of the town of L'Aquila. Uh, they were killed because they were asleep in their beds and the earthquake destroyed many of the structures in that town. Uh, interesting thing was uh, the government there decided to arrest and try six scientists on the grounds that they had not properly predicted the earthquake and had not warned the people of L'Aquila of the risks of going to sleep in their own homes. Uh, they were actually convicted initially. Uh, you have to ask whether that represented a misuse of the concept of accountability, whether a concept of accountability even was appropriate given the limitations of science at the time. One uh, interesting footnote is that while the scientists were acquitted upon appeal, the uh, deputy director of the Civil Protection Agency was not. And he actually served time for providing overly aggressive assurances, if you will, of the uh, safety of the town uh, and cautioned people, or failed to caution people, about the risks associated with the tremors that had existed just before then. Now, most of the time when we're dealing with the concept of accountability, we're typically not dealing with issues associated with natural disasters, but we're typically dealing with other safety incidents, uh, in particular major system failures that result in significant loss of life and in many times have very high uh, public uh, perceptions. Uh, arguably, one of the best examples of this has to do with the uh, loss of the Challenger, the Space Shuttle Challenger, back in 86. Uh, and this was a very traumatic incident, I have to tell you, not just for those of us who were working in the space industry at the time, but I think for the general population at large. There had been such an attachment to the shuttle program as part of the U.S. continued leadership in space. Uh, President Reagan commissioned an investigation, a commission, uh, to investigate the matter and understand what had happened, make a determination of cause, and identify who should be held accountable. And he asked the former Secretary of State, uh, William Rogers, to lead that commission. Actually, a very notable group of individuals included a number of uh, test pilots and astronauts, as well as one Nobel laureate, Richard Feynman, uh, who provided a degree of technical uh, expertise to the panel. Uh, I won't go into the details of the technical assessment. For those of you who are interested in that, uh, please come by Space 583 next term. We will go through all of this. Uh, I will just say that the commission had very little difficulty in identifying the direct, or what we sometimes refer to as the proximate cause of this. And it had to do with the way in which the solid rocket boosters were assembled, uh, which was basically that they were built in pieces and put together with joints in between those pieces. And the seal, the critical seal of those joints was made using uh, elastomers, uh, O-rings, that were susceptible to low temperature conditions. In other words, they did not have the resiliency at low temperature that was necessary to be able to seal properly. And this particular launch was the coldest launch. It was actually 20 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than any previous launch that had been done with the shuttle. And 
it resulted, those conditions, in addition to very high crosswinds, uh, resulted in a tragedy. In addition to assessing the direct cause, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, the Rogers Commission did was to assess what we call the contributing and the systemic factors that added to the problems associated with this uh, disaster. And in particular, there was a lot of focus on the decision to launch. And this became an issue because of several considerations, one of which was that the engineers at the organization that designed and produced those solid rocket boosters, Thiokol, uh, advised NASA initially not to launch. And in fact, several engineers there were very vociferous in their objections to launching based on the predicted temperature uh, at the time of launch. Uh, their objections were overruled by Thiokol management uh, under pressure from NASA. Thiokol management initially was behind the engineers, but they basically were strong-armed by a NASA marshal to rescind their rejection and actually put their approval in writing. By the way, in addition to the issues associated with the O-rings, uh, one of the other issues that was raised uh, just prior to launch had to do with ice buildup, in this case on the service module, uh, the service structure. Uh, the ice, in particular on that day, uh, included icicles of over a foot long. And to a certain extent, this posed another risk to the shuttle, presaging, if you will, the loss of Columbia later on. Uh, both of these issues were raised at what's called level three in the review process associated with getting approval for launch. In both cases, the uh, issues were adjudicated at a low level and were never passed on to the higher levels and never made uh, evident, never made known to NASA leadership. Uh, the commission basically said, well, this was a problem with communication. This was a problem with the review process. Uh, it should have been done differently, but oh, by the way, the commission is strongly of the opinion, and I can't quote it exactly, but effectively what they said was, we're comfortable that had that information been presented to NASA management, they would not have approved the launch. Uh, failure of communications, a failure of culture, basically an exoneration, if you will, of the NASA leadership at the time. Uh, I mentioned Richard Feynman. Uh, Feynman had a problem with all of this. He had such a problem with it that initially he refused to sign off on the commission report, which was you know, a real issue for Rogers because not having a uh, universally, a commonly accepted report would be considered politically uh, a disaster. The compromise that was cut there was that Feynman got to write an appendix, which was added to the report, and you can pick it up online if you're interested in it. And basically, Feynman goes after NASA leadership and says that your overall assessment of the shuttle safety is off by roughly three orders of magnitude. Just a little detail. And the whole idea that the shuttle is safe because it has to be safe is part of your foundation here, and none of this is appropriate. And the whole approach of NASA to safety was inappropriate. Uh, interesting. Who is culpable? Who is accountable for such matters? Uh, let me switch to a, another example here. I'm going to talk about the Macondo Well, commonly known as Deepwater Horizon. Deepwater Horizon is actually the name of the oil drilling rig that was used to develop uh, the uh, Macondo Well. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, 11 workers were killed when there was a blowout, an explosion and fire associated with the Macondo well. And this not only killed 11 people on the rig, but also caused uh, just tremendous environmental, ecological, and economic damage to the whole Gulf region. Uh, 
this was an interesting challenge here, in part in terms of understanding how all of this work was done and how uh, all of this came about. By the way, my personal involvement in this was that, uh, as you heard, I got to chair the uh, committee that oversaw the uh, investigation here uh, of the cause. Uh, one of the things we found was that uh, we were challenged. Uh, challenged, why? Well, Department of Justice uh, made a very public statement that they were going to try to figure out uh, who should be jailed for this event. Who should be thrown into jail? And all of a sudden, all the witnesses that had previously offered to provide us with insight into uh, what transpired and how all of this was uh, uh, occurred, uh, those witnesses were unwilling to testify in any, in any proper form. Uh, that said, we did find out what happened. Uh, and not unlike the issues with Challenger, uh, much of this has to do with decisions. Decisions that were made at the tail end of the development of the Macondo well. I don't want to go through the technical details here, but effectively the well had been drilled. Uh, there was a decision made to do what's called a well of sealing and abandonment uh, with the idea that uh, they would come back to the area after the infrastructure was installed that would provide a, a mechanism of taking the oil from that area and sending it back to shore. Uh, the way of sealing the well was using cement. Uh, that cement was tested multiple times and that cement was found to be wanting multiple times. Nonetheless, the decision was made to go ahead and abandon the well that precipitated uh, the start of uh, hydrocarbon flow. Uh, the crew did not respond to that effectively. And the net was we had a, a total loss of control of the well, what's known as a blowout. Again, contributing in systemic uh, factors here. You see the word safety culture. What is culture? Culture is what you do and no one tells you what to do. Why is that important? Well, when you're dealing in a world of regulations that are carefully prescribed, you find that you can't anticipate all the different things that might happen. Prescriptive regulations are inherently incomplete and out of date. Uh, you need to have a culture to be able to deal with such matters. Uh, figuring out who was accountable in all of this was complicated furthermore by the, just the business arrangements that are used offshore. Uh, it's a very complex business. There's a joint venture who actually has the lease. One of the members of the joint venture, in this case BP, is deemed to be the operating contractor. That operating contractor hires a rig that is operated, actually, by the rig owner. And oh, by the way, the operating company, BP, hires the people that are going to do many of the other services, like cementing, in which case the subject was Halliburton. By the way, if you go and take a look at a typical rig, you'll find there's maybe 120, 130 people on the rig, of which typically no more than two represent the operating company. So, who's accountable for this? Well, the focus was clearly going to be on BP for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was the terrible experience that they had uh, experienced just a few years earlier with the Texas City oil refinery disaster, which killed 15 and injured 180 people, uh, arguably the worst industrial accident that's occurred in the oil and gas industry. Uh, and oh, by the way, BP is now wound up uh, between the actual direct costs of dealing with the disaster, the liabilities, and the fines that they've paid. They've paid roughly $65 billion in total costs. Fairly significant. But we get into the question of, well, who is really responsible? Is it just the company or is it the people in the company? Uh, and one of the things, if you go and take a look at BP's answer to this, because they had their own report, First of all, 
their argument is the principal culpable individual, the principal individuals that should be accountable, were Halliburton, the people that were doing the cementing. Um, and oh, by the way, if there's anybody in BP that's accountable, it's the two people that they had as representatives on the rig. It's an interesting process. Uh, one of the things I find fascinating is that if you take a look at the people on the rig, uh, out of 130 some odd people, you might find a handful who had anything more than a high school education. Uh, this is the highest compensated blue collar community in the United States and arguably in the world. And they learn their jobs on the job. It's OJT, on the job training. And yet, they're making critical decisions. The decisions are made offshore. Now, why is that? Well, some of this is just the history of what comes out in the maritime community. In the old days, a ship that uh, goes out of port, pretty soon it's over the horizon, and the master of the ship is responsible for everything. No other way of dealing with it. And that concept initially came up in the offshore oil and gas industry. The people on the vessel, on the rig, have to have the total and complete control and have all of the authorities necessary to conduct their business. Even though, in many cases, they really had limited formal education uh, on many of the matters that they were dealing with. Uh, at the time that this event occurred, 10 years ago, we were starting to see a way out of all of this with satellite communications. It is possible to have real-time information associated with wells all over the world shipped back to a common area where they can be overseen and where people can be brought in to be able to assist in any critical decision. Uh, the Real-Time Operations Center here, uh, shown in the photo, uh, is Shell's facility. Uh, at the time, uh, just after uh, the uh, Deepwater Horizon blowout, they were watching wells, uh, this was Shell now, was watching wells in the Caspian Sea from New Orleans. Easy to do. Not all companies bought into the idea. They didn't buy into it for several reasons. One of which was they thought that having somebody overseeing what was going on in the rig undercut the authority of the people out in the rig, that the people out in the rig would expect to get second-guessed and would not put their best thoughts into the matter. Also, quite frankly, I think it also detracted from some of the responsibility spreading that was endemic within the industry. Uh, the industry had gone from an area where vertically integrated oil and gas companies took full responsibility for all aspects associated with offshore uh, exploration and development to an era where they were really just managing a process and having multiple subcontractors do the majority of the work. And to a certain extent, they liked that. It was a spreading out of the liabilities associated with this type of a process. And I think that to a certain extent, one of the difficult aspects of these real-time operations centers is that all of a sudden, it is possible to bring in senior management to help make decisions when you're having to trade off cost and schedule and safety. Uh, contrast this a little bit with the experiences that we have in the Navy, and we're going to talk about offshore activity. I think we need to talk about the Navy. Uh, commanding officer accountability. It's a very simple concept in the US Navy. It's a concept of strict accountability. CO's responsible, end of discussion. Doesn't matter how long they've been in command. As soon as that CO says, I have my orders, I am in command, they are responsible. They are accountable for everything that goes on, whether they're on the bridge, whether they're in a mess, whether they're asleep, it doesn't matter. I had a few cases where I was asked by members of Congress actually challenged by members of Congress who were interested in supporting their constituents and who asked very uh, seriously whether it was fair. My response to that was very simply, it was fair to the Navy, okay? Why was it fair to the Navy? Well, 
we made it very clear what the expectations were on the commanding officer. You can't go ahead and say, well, we'll give you five minutes, we'll give you five hours, we'll give you five days, we'll give you five weeks. How do you do that? Who's responsible during that time period? You need to have somebody responsible and accountable. Clearly, it was the CO in command. And oh, by the way, that motivated the commanding officer to as soon as he could or she could to determine what was the state of their ship, what was the state of their crew, what was the state of the subordinate officers, and to actually make decisions recognizing those matters and those limitations. And we actually have had cases where new COs have come in and said, no, I'm not in a position to get underway. I can't do it. Sometimes that happens, sometimes that doesn't happen, and sometimes people do bad things, and when that happens, we wind up disciplining COs and more senior officers. And all of this happened in the aftermath of the McCain and Fitzgerald disasters that occurred recently. Uh, both of these in Seventh Fleet of Operations, uh, McCain uh, off of Singapore, Fitzgerald uh, off of Japan. Uh, ten sailors were killed in the incident uh, with McCain, uh, seven with uh, the uh, collision on the Fitzgerald. Uh, one thing I find very notable there is not only were the CO and XO, the executive officer, held accountable, but so was the squadron commander and the seventh fleet commander. No question as to the hierarchy there and the responsibilities that are shared as authority is delegated. One of the things we find all the time is that organizations don't like that. They don't want to identify their own leadership as being accountable for significant disasters. Uh, if they do, they're basically begging for you know, liability determination, whether that is direct in terms of litigation or whether that's indirect in terms of the way the stock market values that corporation. Uh, they like to see suppliers, they like to have uh, lower level people held accountable. Invariably, very, well, very rarely do they hold their executives accountable. Yes, Tony Hayward, the CEO of BP, lost his job as a result of Deepwater Horizon. But I would argue that he really didn't lose his job because of the blowout. He lost his job because of the way he managed the blowout and the very bad PR that he created for uh, the BP organization. And oh, by the way, the board of directors were never held accountable. But you have to ask, shouldn't the board of directors, after the Texas City disaster, after being told that the cost of exploration and development that BP had was the lowest in the industry, significantly lower than their competition, what risks they were taking by pursuing that very, very low cost uh, activity? These are questions that need to be asked because an organization has got to make these trades. Whether you're dealing with, pardon the uh, acronym here, environmental health and safety issues, how they work off of trades with cost, what the priorities are for investment, and what type of organization culture do you develop. And oh, by the way, as we look in the future, at new roles, perhaps, for both government organizations and private industry. Are we going to ask for accountability from those organizations? Are we going to ask for accountability of their executives? And can you have one without the other? Just a few thoughts, and we can have a conversation now. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Which side would you prefer? I was told to take this side. Excellent. Fantastic. I'm not sure why, but it'll work fine. Super. Well, thank you for those opening comments. And uh, again, welcome everyone to Michigan Ross. It's good to have you all here. Uh, in the spirit of Veterans Week, I want to open just by thanking all of our uniformed vets in the audience for their service. Thank you for that. Excellent. Good to have you here. 
And certainly thank you to all of the, uh, the non-uniformed uh, vets from uh, previous times, uh, like myself. So I was a, a naval aviator from 1986 to 1999, uh, flew F-18s for a few years and then left the military uh, to start a little company called JetBlue. Maybe you heard of that. Um, but I've spent the last 20 years uh, exploring uh, military leadership lessons and how they uh, can be applied in the kind of the business environment. And that's how I'm going to frame up our conversation tonight. And in the spirit of thank yous, uh, sometimes uh, the non-uniformed folks don't get uh, the attention they deserve. So thank you, sir, for your service in leading the, uh, the Navy. I'm a little disappointed I didn't have the opportunity to serve under you. Um, but that's something we can talk about oh, some other ways. time. Um, so, um, so our agenda, just to be clear about uh, ROE, so for about 15 minutes or so, I've got some prepared questions that I'll ask uh, Mr. Secretary. And uh, I am hoping that the opening uh, talk generated some thoughts in your minds. And if it, uh, if it did, um, record the questions as, uh, as you were asked to do, and we have folks walking around collecting those. If anything comes up in our conversation, or if you have any other question uh, for the Secretary, please uh, write it down on a note, and we will spend the last 20, 25 minutes or so of our conversation uh, today with your questions, which is what we really want to hear, because these are, who cares about these? I came up with these. Um, so as we get started, uh, so of all the things that you could have chatted about with us this evening, you chose these topics. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, two reasons. First of all, uh, of all of the things that I've been involved in, uh, Putting aside uh, the issues associated with uh, being in charge of a military organization at the time of war and dealing with the casualties that come back, mm -hmm. the next most significant thing that I dealt with uh, had to do with accidents and the loss of life of people who were not in the military. Uh, I will argue that the uh, uh, state that my absolute worst experience as secretary was having to fly out to California to pay a condolence call on the family uh, that uh, was devastated when an F-18 uh, augured into their home just outside of Miramar, uh, killed a mother, a grandmother, and two infants. And I had to apologize on behalf of the United States for what we had done to that family. Uh, those are things that uh, really get you and uh, uh, live with you forever. And I find that uh, all too often matters associated with safety are taught with a little bit more of an academic and analytical perspective than is appropriate. Uh, when I've done my lectures on safety, I try to explain to uh, my class that uh, my principal objective is to hopefully help them avoid some of the situations that I've felt myself get put into. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they can, if, if I can do that, that would be great. Uh, in the lectures I typically give over in uh, College of Engineering, more focused on the technical aspects, more the procedural aspects. The management aspects, though, I think are equally uh, important. And uh, the whole issue of how an organization deals with such matters and how it establishes the appropriate culture uh, and deals with these trade-offs is absolutely critical. Uh, one of the uh, unfortunate experiences that I had uh, dealing with Deepwater Horizon, uh, dealing with some of the companies that thought they had good safety programs, but really didn't. And invariably, I was told, we were told as a committee, that, uh, oh, we never compromise safety. Well, I'm sorry. The minute you start drilling a well, the minute you send people offshore, you're compromising safety. The question is, what is a reasonable compromise of safety? What are the standards that you want to use? How do you establish those trade-offs? We throw around buzzwords like, uh, it's called ALARP, as low as reasonably practicable. Okay, that's in the regulations. Great phrase. What does it mean? 
how do you make a determination? And who makes that determination? And oh, by the way, uh, you know, sitting on corporate boards and now being responsible for organizations and having one of those corporations have a fatality here recently, it kind of brings it to a head one more time. This is a continuing issue that needs to be addressed. So I'm pleased to be able to bring the issue here. Great. Well, I, I, I hope that especially for our Ross students here, both our, our undergraduate BBA degree, our graduate MBA degree, we call those general management degrees. And I'd like to think that the notions of accountability and authority and responsibility are front and center to mm -hmm. those students that are achieving those degrees. So I'll ask the audience here if they're interested in this question or we can move on. Um, even having served myself for 13 years, I can't even fathom what it's like uh, to, to live a day in the life of a, of a military secretary. Um, would you be willing to share a couple of minutes of just what that experience is like? Is that something that would interest you? Okay, I see at least three nods. That, that was my threshold, so three is good. So, so what's it like to be Secretary of the Navy? Well, uh, uh, I was Gordon England's relief uh, when Gordon uh, became DepSecDef, Deputy Secretary of Defense. And uh, he told me that uh, uh, you gotta realize that with close to a million men and women under your authority, and that's active duty, reserve, civilian and military, both okay. Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, you're gonna find out that on any given day, somebody somewhere is doing something really, really stupid. Okay. And one of your challenges is gonna to be to deal with all of that and the consequences of it. Uh, my day always started out early in the morning, got picked up by uh, NCIS, and uh, in the car were three books uh, that I was to go through very quickly on the way into the Pentagon. First book was the casualty reports from the day before. This was in the middle of Iraq. You know, Al Anbar province, we were taking casualties every day. What happened? Who was wounded? How are they being treated? Where are they physically at any given point in time? really gets your head into what's really important of all of this. Uh, next book, sit rep situation reports, you know, what's going on with the fleet, where the ships, any ca uh, mechanical casualties on the ships, things of that nature. And the last is press clippings. Why is that important? The minute you hit the building, you're gonna be inundated with questions Got to be able to deal with all of that. Uh, that's how the day started. Uh, you never know how the day is going to end or when it's going to end. Okay, and uh, the calls keep coming. You know, late at night. Uh, worst experience was a uh, uh, call at two o'clock in the morning. By the way, those calls at two o'clock in the morning are never because somebody wants to tell you how well things are going. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but that call was, uh, sir, we think we lost the sub. And uh, by the time I got into the building, which was uh, 3.30 in the morning, uh, they had finally figured out that what we had lost was communications with the sub, not the sub itself. But oh, by the way, in that short interval, uh, we already had, the Brits were already uh, getting ready to uh, stage their part of the submarine rescue program that uh, we do jointly with a number of uh, countries. Uh, and it was amazing to see the response. You never know what's gonna happen. Uh, and you gotta just be resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just say that when I went in, I thought I was reasonably well prepared for the job. Um, I had managed a uh, five, six billion dollar a year business before I went into the Pentagon. I had people all over the world. I knew how to deal with deployed organizations. And I knew the technology. So I thought I'd be well prepared for it. Uh, the emotional side though, the dealing with the casualties, the dealing with the families, totally different level. 
And uh, that took some time. I'll just say that uh, there are some uh, Goldstorm mothers that uh, I still stay in touch with. Excellent. Was it, um, uh, it sounds like every day was certainly an interesting, unique challenge. Was it satisfying? Were you, were you able to sleep? Do you feel good looking back on it? Look, it's not a fun, fun job, right. okay? But it is, without a doubt, the most satisfying experience I've had professionally in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I would tell anybody who has that opportunity to take advantage of it. Yeah. Well, if you knew that it was me you were handing a $30 million airplane to to go fly around, I, I wouldn't have slept either. either. So uh, <laughs> I get that. Um, so I've got a couple specific questions about leadership, sure. but just generally. So we talked about uh, authority, um, accountability, and responsibility in your talk. As you, having led large organizations, both in the military and business, are there some, uh, perhaps two or three suggestions that you have for business leaders, lessons that maybe you, you were able to hone in the military uh, beyond the, the concepts that you talked about today, just good leadership lessons that, that shape who you are as a senior leader? Uh, I, I think, first of all, uh, having an organization that tests the boundaries of what might happen and understand the level of preparation that you have for dealing with any one of a number of incidents. Mm -hmm. uh, this was something we had to do all the time in the Pentagon because we really didn't know what was going to be happening. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to fall into the mode when you've got a business organization that's doing well, that's turning product, that's cash flow is good, profit's reasonable. What's not to like about this? Uh, never get comfortable with that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, think about what might happen mm -hmm. and think about the worst thing that might happen and it's going to be worse than that. And it may never occur, but if it does, you'll be much better prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And being able to assess how your subordinates deal with all of that is an interesting process in and of itself. Uh, one of the things I'm a very strong advocate of is uh, something we call desk topping. It's an exercise, and you just go and you say, good morning, gentlemen. Guess what just happened today? Uh, just as an example of one that I'm st structuring or structured for a company that I am uh, on the board of. Good morning. Uh, you've just gotten an email. Your files have all been encrypted, and you are now requested to provide 100 bitcoins to this address. What are you going to do? Who are you going to call? How are you going to manage the day? Tell me. And it's kind of an intro. Well, you know, but, but we've done all of this stuff. We've prepared. We've got cybersecurity. We've got, you know, all. No, this has happened to you. Tell me how you're going to deal with it. Well, you know, can we talk about this later? Can, no. Because it could happen tomorrow. You don't get a chance to prepare. Try that out on an organization. Mm -hmm. See how they respond to it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, it's uh, interesting because one of the, the questions I had prepared a little later on was uh, I teach a crisis leadership course here to MBAs, and I make the claim at the beginning of the class that, in, that my military experience taught me and my business experience validated that, that crises are no longer ifs, they're whens. They're, they're going to happen. So my question for you was, would you agree with that statement and how important is it to be prepared for the inevitable crisis? Look, uh, I mean, it's been said many times that there are two types of organizations uh, now in the world, uh, those that have been hacked and those that don't know that they've been hacked. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and, and, and I think it's, it's just getting worse. And it's very obvious that this is a, uh, uh, 
a problem that we're just starting to come to grips with, and the consequences of it are going to be even more so, more important in the future. When we start talking about the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. when we start talking about uh, the potential networking of vehicles mm -hmm. for autonomous operation, when we talk about autonomous aircraft, uh, the consequences are tremendous, and the consequences of somebody taking control of one of these vehicles. It's incredible. So, yeah, these crises are going to happen. If you asked me, if you asked anybody in the business 10, 15, 20 years ago, would we be having ransomware attacks? People said, well, you know, yeah, we get some kids and a you know, the, living with their parents, operating out of their basements, playing around, proving to their buds that they can get into a computer. No, this is big, this, this is big stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've seen a, any small fraction of what's gonna be the problem in the future. Mm -hmm. So yeah, be prepared. Good, um, I hope we have some questions. Then I will ask one last one and then we'll move to uh, questions from the floor. Um, this is a question about diversity and diversity of thought. So clearly in organizations uh, in military business all over uh, are really focused on diversity as, a, as an objective. Um, I know as I was uh, concluding my time in the Navy, there were lots of early movements on diversity efforts and I'm certain, although I wasn't keeping close tabs on you, that that was a major part of what you had to deal with on a regular basis. So how do you, from your experience, how do you think about the, uh, not only the importance of diversity, but how, to, how organizations should go about it? I think organizations need to think about diversity relative to what their objectives are for diversity. Why are you doing diversity? What is your objective in it? You know, one of the things we used to focus on quite a bit when I was uh, uh, doing my Navy bit, particularly in the Marine Corps, but also for the Navy, was making sure we could make the numbers, okay? Recruiting, we have an all-volunteer force. And if we're gonna have an all-volunteer force, we need to be able to have an addressable market, if you will, of recruits that represents the totality of the United States. We can't be focused just in one general area. Mm -hmm. And it was frustrating, I will tell you. Uh, we had members of Congress who would not nominate uh, candidates to the Naval Academy, did not feel it was appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. uh, tremendous loss of opportunity. We have geographical disparity. The proclivity to serve is so geographically distributed, maldistributed in the United States, it's very unfortunate. I think uh, we, we, when we went to uh, the all-volunteer uh, force, uh, we did that also at the same time we adopted something called BRAC that I'm sure you're aware of, Base Realignment and Closure. Uh, we used to have bases up and down the East Coast of the United States. We also have facilities here in the middle of the Midwest. Most of those have been closed. Mm -hmm. It's more efficient to have fleet concentration areas in Tidewater, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, San Diego. I mean, very efficient operations. But what it means is the vast majority of people in the United States have no connection anymore to the military. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we work that? What's our objective? How do we get people that have the diverse backgrounds so that when you're going out and you're recruiting, people say, oh, hey, that person looks like me. Maybe I'll go and see if this works for me. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, you get into other issues. Uh, we want language skills. Where are we going to get some of the language skills? Well, you got you know people not too far from Ann Arbor, a little town called Dearborn, who have more people who understand some of the languages that we're interested in nowadays than any place else in the United States. How many of them feel comfortable in joining the military? Mm -hmm. So 
I like to think, yes, diversity is, is critical, but we need to think about what is, what is our end objective for that diversity? And how do we accomplish that? And, it, and I will just suggest that the measures you take to ensure you have diversity need to be tailored to what it is that you're trying to effect through that diversity. Excellent. Does that make any sense? That makes total sense. And, uh, and thanks for opening the old BRAC wound. Um, oh, sorry about I that. Was, uh, I was running the Top Gun School in San Diego when we turned San, uh, Miramar over to the Marines and moved up to Fallon, Nevada, which was a great place to fly. But that's about it. Anyway, uh, that said, I would love to turn the, uh, the Q&A over to our guests here from the Ford School. Yes? Yes? And, wh and what's your name? Hi, uh, good evening. Um, thank you so much for being here, sir. Uh, my name is Karuna Nankumar, and I'm currently a junior in the Ford BA program. I'm hoping to pursue a career in uh, national security and diplomacy. Um, just to start us off, um, I was wondering, what do you think are the advantages and constraints of the way that responsibility is uh, structured um, in the Navy, for example, with the, um, the CO? Uh, and do you think that this kind of accountability structure is implementable or should be implemented in other industries and organizations? Well, first of all, I, I think that there's two issues there, one of which is uh, who accepts accountability? And I'm a very strong believer in the strict concept of accountability that a commanding officer has to be held accountable from the moment they say, I am in command, to the moment that they are relieved. Uh, now, it's not just that commanding officer. And there's also the more senior officers, as we saw with McCain and Fitzgerald, that that passes up. But there also has to be a recognition of uh, how do you use that concept of accountability. Uh, Mike Mullen, who was a, a CNO, Chief of Naval Operations, and later on Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, used to remind people that uh, his ship had actually run aground at one point in time when he was uh, CEO of that ship. Um, absolute accountability. Are we going to go ahead and say your career is over just because of that incident? Not necessarily. Who's accountable? No question, the CO is accountable. But how that accountability is used needs to be tailored to the severity of the event and the potential for use of that as a learning experience as opposed to just a pure punishment aspect. There are cases where, yes, you want to put up, pardon the expression, a head on the post outside the village gate, okay, and make it very clear uh, to everybody as to what is expected. Uh, and I, I note that uh, of the three service secretaries who went in at the same time, uh, myself and the Secretary of the Army and Secretary of the Air Force, I was the only one who was not asked to resign, okay? and. Uh, those other two cases were arguably more about making a point than they were truly in punishment. So it's a matter of tailoring the issue. And I think that's really what, uh, what needs to be done. How that applies to a uh, uh, corporate world is something that also has to be done in an appropriately tailored manner. Uh, when you take an individual like Tony Hayward and you give him a wonderful package to uh, uh, make it easy for him to resign by mutual agreement, uh, which was the phraseology. You know, by the way, he didn't totally resign from BP, he became a member of the board of, a, of BP's activity in Russia and got a very nice year's worth of compensation and all sorts of other things. Uh, you know, what message are you giving? What is the objective of holding somebody accountable? To what extent are you trying to send a message? To what extent are you trying to remove somebody who has shown bad judgment? To what extent are you trying to deal with the politics of the situation? What are the objectives and structure your concept of accountability appropriately? Thank you.
So uh, thank you for, for being with here, here with us this evening. My name is Edward Elliott. I'm a Masters in Public Affairs student at Ford School. And uh, before coming here, I was working for several years in London and UK foreign policy issues. Um, just also to add for everyone on the way out, there's a whole bunch of information there on Veterans Week here at the University of Michigan. So do grab some on the way out. Um, so, so my question is that you noted uh, that boards of directors usually escape being held personally accountable. Um, but what what occupies that role when it comes to the policy world? Um, are they more or less often held accountable, and and who, and who occupies that that equivalent role? Uh, there are on occasion uh, boards that oversee government activities. Okay, uh, that are responsible for policy making uh, decisions. Uh, I will suggest that uh, we have a similar problem in the government board structures, that uh, they are rarely held accountable. Uh, and, the respon and yet the responsibility that they often receive is very significant. Uh, it is a challenge. Uh, people say, well, you know, why should I take a position on a board? Why should I take a uh, overseeing responsibility? Um, there's a lot of risk to that, professional risk, reputational risk, liabilities, although almost in all cases you have what's called DNO insurance, directors and officers insurance that uh, covers most of these matters. Um, for the most part, when you go into, say, uh, the policy shop in the Pentagon, uh, what is their accountability? Their accountability is their job. <coughs> as with any other job, uh, they're at risk there. Not in a sense of financial risk, because we don't operate in government that way. Uh, the amount of uh, <coughs> uh, discretionary compensation, variable compensation in government is, near, is nil. It's a small amount, but it's really not significant. And so basically it's all through people being able to retain their job, and people being able to move up into positions. Great. Not particularly effective, but that's what it is. <coughs> All right, thank you. Um, the next question comes from the audience. You talked about <coughs> the importance of culture in an organization. As the leader of an extremely large um, organization such as the Navy, how do you identify and implement these culture changes? Uh, First of all, you gauge culture by seeing how the organization responds to challenges. Um, and there are all sorts of challenges. There are challenges like what we've talked about today. There are challenges of individuals who do not do well within an organization, who do things that are improper. <coughs> um, and what you have to do is you take all of that in and you can make an assessment very quickly, I think, of whether or not you've got an effective culture, the type of culture that you want, or a type of culture that is wanting and in need of improvement. And the way in which you get the culture you want is basically by rewarding people for doing the right thing, and yes, punishing people for doing the bad things. But I find that more times than not, uh, rewarding somebody for doing something good, catch them doing something good, can be as beneficial as <clears throat> putting that head on a pike outside the village gate. And so what you want to do is you want to try to tell people, this is the behavior that we want to see. This is good. We're going to stand behind this individual. And yes, this person violated the normal standards, but they did the right thing. And we'll stand behind them and we'll defend them. Excellent. Here, here. Um, so, so my question is in, in relation to to a, a recent case re related to the U.S. and the U.K. and diplomatic immunity, um, and how uh, an American woman who I think was a partner of of someone or was working in the U.S. embassy in the U.K. Um, was driving on the wrong side of the road and uh, killed a 19-year-old um, British citizen. Um, in that case. 
because the, the, the you know the, the structures you know she she left immediately back to the US and and we haven't kind of had that that resolution from a responsibility but where where does that that responsibility lie in those situations and that's a sort of specific example but I guess it can be expanded broad more broadly to the concept of diplomatic immunity or, or other political immunities that's a difficult situation and I uh, do recognize and I, I work with the people over at state all the time and uh, I expect that they're challenged in terms of trying to defend the concept of diplomatic immunity because of the potential downside should we start compromising it. And it's always this question of the slippery slope. Uh, all of that said, uh, it's very disappointing that somebody should try to escape that type of situation. Uh, I would have expected her to stay in the UK and face the music and not argue diplomatic immunity. That's what's expected of our people. They're expected to behave appropriately. Yes, diplomatic immunity is something that you rely on in some very difficult situations, especially in cultures that have very different mores and expectations. Uh, and in particular in countries that will use uh, purported criminal matters as a way of uh, executing their own policy objectives. Uh, but when it comes to a matter like this, no, it's disappointing, very disappointing. Um, is state going to direct her to go back? I don't know. I'm not the right person to answer that question. We have time for one, maybe two questions if they're short. All right, uh, this one, this one's a good one. Um, comes from Craig Pote, a Navy vet in the audience. Um, as AI proliferates in public and private organizations and makes more and more of our decisions, who is or should be accountable for the decisions that the systems make? <laughs> that is really a, a fascinating question. We could spend the entire evening talking about that. Uh, I had the opportunity to engage on some matters of uh, 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 dealing with automatic systems and dealing with systems that uh, perhaps could respond very quickly to challenges in the field. And one of the questions that always came up was, you know, how can you be sure whether those systems are going to work properly? And so we always invariably resort, you know, came back to the position of saying we need a human involved, final decision to be a human, even recognizing the frailty of human behavior and never knowing what that human is going to do. Uh, that's obviously getting encroached. More and more decisions are being made. Uh, I have to tell you, I worry about two aspects of all of that. I worry about not just whether or not the algorithms are being developed properly, but whether they're implemented appropriately. And the difficulties, the challenges of what we call verification and validation of complex software is just so tremendous. And you can see it right now. You take a look at the 737 MAX situation and all the issues that are coming up uh, associated with the uh, verification and validation, not just of the MCAS, the specific software module that's uh, under question here, but other related matters. It's really, really hard. How many updates do you get to your operating system on your phone or your laptop? People are finding mistakes, problems, challenges, whether it's a coding error or whether it's just a vulnerability that was not uh, foreseen ahead of time. These are happening all the time. We have to make a quantum leap in terms of how we do verification and validation to be able to really move to the next generation of software dominated systems. Um, the other thing that I worry about is the whole question of cybersecurity and can you really trust an AI system? Um, 
Can you trust that it's not going to be impacted by somebody who doesn't want it to work properly or somebody who's just trying to see whether or not it can be affected? These are tremendous challenges, and I think they represent some of the most significant potential impediments associated with going to that next generation of autonomy, of AI, of all of those potential advantages associated with the computing power, which is just within reach right now. One more quick question. All right, um, so, so we'll ask one more quick question, but also for everyone in the audience whose questions haven't had a chance to be read, we will be sharing them with the secretary um, after the event. So <clears throat> this last question here is, as, as Secretary of Navy, how did you balance delegation whilst also um, maintaining a level of accountability that you felt comfortable with? Uh, the critical issue for me in terms of delegation was being able to gauge uh, the people that you were delegating authorities to. And uh, I will say that the most difficult decisions that I had was associated with putting the right people in the right positions. And being able to assess how somebody's going to be able to deal with a new situation is a very, very challenging problem. Uh, but that's what you got to do. And yes, we wind up relieving a lot of individuals in command responsibility and, and, and who have significant command responsibilities. And that's because you can only do so much in terms of assessing how they will do. I personally believe that our processes associated with officer promotion are wanting. We've gotten so far into the mode of taking measures to avoid any potential misuse of the system with promotion boards and limiting the information that can be used by those promotion boards to make decisions. Uh, that in some cases we're making it difficult to use that which is really should be available to be able to better assess how an individual will be able to do at that next level. Uh, I've had to remove people. I've had to remove people in very senior positions. It is not fun, especially if you put them in that position in the first place. Because you got to get up and say, I made a mistake. Oh, by the way, I never relieved anybody too early. Okay. It was always later than it should have been. And that's not a good sign. Okay. Well, sir, thank you very much for being with us tonight. It would have been uh, a joy to spend another couple of hours here. Unfortunately, time is time. Any, any reflections from your conversation, your chat, your presentation, and the questions that have come up this evening? Any closing thoughts that, uh, that you'd like folks to take away from this discussion? No, I just think... Uh, it's interesting that we have this activity co-sponsored by three different parts of the University of Michigan. And I will just say that uh, uh, I've had only a few activities, few opportunities to go outside of the College of Engineering. Uh, I've enjoyed them all, even in interaction with the law school. Okay, I don't always enjoy dealing with the lawyers as a something associated with that, but um, I think this is good. Uh, I've enjoyed it, and I think we need to figure out other mechanisms of doing more of this sort of thing, because it's so easy to just deal in the very simple structure of the colleges and schools, and oh, by the way, the departments within those colleges, and oh, by the way, the courses within those departments. Mm -hmm. And very soon you get very narrow, very structured, and you lose the value. If nothing else, to go back to your comment about diversity, one of the values here is getting a diverse conversation going not just people that come to the problem from an engineering perspective or from a military perspective, but looking at it from a management perspective, a policy perspective, and sharing those different thoughts. 
Couldn't agree more. Please join me in thanking Secretary Winner for his time. Excellent.